<laughs> I'm not crying, you are. <laughs> yeah, sad times. Final week in the book of James, on the podcast anyway. Don't know what you're doing in your rooty groups. We are heading through at various places and paces. Um, but the final week, hearing those sweet, sweet tones of Matt Bounds. It's been wonderful to have him. We should invite him back for an in-person Sunday morning sooner or later, shouldn't we? Well, this week, he's finishing off James. He's rounding things up and he's helping us to see and to remember just why and just how important it is to take the gospel and to live it out, to be changed and transformed by it. So, Matty, for one last time, help us to wise up. Yeah, uh, thanks to Sam for reading that passage. Uh, the actual text for this morning is the last two verses of James, James five nineteen to 20, but we're going to be looking back at the passage we covered last week briefly as well. So I'm guessing that most of you have seen uh, a lot of the photos online this week from the, the New Horizons uh, spacecraft. Um, you recall it's been, uh, no, a few, a few are frowning, it's the one that just passed Pluto and it's been sending back photos of uh, Pluto, the most detailed photos of Pluto we've ever seen. When, uh, when the spacecraft left planet Earth in 2006, uh, Pluto was still a planet Poor little Pluto now isn't a planet anymore. It's a um, dwarf planet or, I've been studying, or uh, a large, is it Kuiper or Kuiper belt? Large Kuiper belt object. So it's, it's no longer a, a planet. It's a dwarf planet or that other thing. But the, the, the photos that have come back have been absolutely stunning, haven't they? There have been um, photos of that, that region on Pluto where you've got mountains the size of the Rockies and they're made out of ice. Um, absolutely stunning, that little piece of rock and ice uh, spinning right out on the edge of our solar system that we've seen more clearly than ever before. And I was thinking about uh, Pluto and reading up on it a bit this week, as you do. And uh, one of the interesting things about Pluto, apart from the fact it's so far out, is that it's got a very elliptical orbit. So apparently, there aren't any professional astronomers in the room, are there? Good, okay. Um, apparently, all, all the planets in the solar system have a, have a slightly elliptical orbit, so it's not a perfect circle. Um, but Pluto's is very elliptical, meaning it's more like an oval. So uh, its, its distance from the sun varies an awful lot. Uh, so much so that sometimes it's actually closer to Earth than, that I didn't do my research properly, than the next planet in, which is Neptune. Yeah, so although it's normally further out than Neptune, occasionally it's closer to the sun than Neptune because its orbit is so elliptical. It's, it's got an irregular orbit. There is a reason for all this, by the way. I'm coming back to this in a minute. But there is a reason for mentioning all this. I think in one sense, you know, that's a bit like some professing Christians. People who say that they follow Jesus, uh, but their orbit around the Lord and around his truth and one of the ways you see that is their orbit around the church is quite an irregular one. You know, you've got, you got some Christians and they, their orbit is a nice regular one, close into the truth, into the church. And then others, their orbit's a bit bigger, but fairly regular. And then there's some of us, our orbit's very elliptical. It's like this. You know, sometimes we're close and sometimes we're miles away. Some of us, I think, are like comets sometimes. Our, our orbits are so irregular, you know, we, we fly past and then come back in another 50 years. Um, at, at those who profess to follow Jesus, sometimes their orbit around the truth and around the Lord himself is quite irregular. Some, unfortunately, who we know who say or have said that they love and follow Jesus have gone off uh, in a trajectory into space and we don't even know anymore if it is an orbit around the Lord and his truth and his people because we don't know if they're going to come back. We don't know if it's an orbit or if it's a straight line headed off in that direction. We're not sure if they're coming back or not. And here's the thing, and the reason I mention all this, James knew of such people. He, going back to the big picture of the book of James and what we've been going through, um, Sammy and I with you over the, the past weeks, James knew that there were people in the churches he was writing to who were struggling or failing to live out the gospel. They were failing or struggling to live with gospel wisdom. We've said that wisdom means applying the gospel to the way we live our lives. They, they were struggling to do that. They weren't living out an obviously real faith, a living faith, which is why James had to say to them, faith without works is dead. 
is your faith real if you're not living it out? They weren't persevering well well, in, in trials and in troubles. They weren't dealing well with the whole issue of money. Whether they were poor or rich, they they weren't dealing with it in in a gospel way. They weren't taming their tongues. They weren't exhibiting patience. They weren't showing humility. They weren't praying and trusting in the power of prayer like they should have done. These are all the reasons that James is writing to the people he's writing to. That that was a major concern of his. And that was why he wrote and told the church basically to, to wise up. Start applying the gospel to the way you're living your lives. In all these ways that I've covered. But as he draws to a close, and as he's just been encouraging them, as we saw last week, about the power of prayer to keep them in a living faith, keep them through trials, keep them in sickness, he moves now his focus to those who had said they were followers of Jesus, appeared to be followers of Jesus, maybe were followers of Jesus, but who are now wandering away. And the reason I mentioned the the planet or dwarf planet Pluto is that uh, the word there that James uses for wandering away is literally they were planeting away. It's the same word that was used of planets. Planets were called that because the, the, the ancient astronomers noticed that they wandered around the sky. And as James says that some of these people have wandered from the truth, he says literally they planeted away from the truth. Their orbit has become irregular. He now focuses on them, those who had wandered off or were in the process of wandering off. Why does he end with, with this subject? I mean, as you read through James, sometimes it, it sometimes seems, doesn't it? We've said this before, like he, he abruptly here and there introduces a new subject. And you're thinking, why has he done that? But when you cast your eye over it, you see there is a flow. There is a logic to it. Why does he end with this subject, the wanderer? Partly, I guess, because... It's inextricably linked with prayer, which is what he's just been talking about. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. But largely, I think, because helping a sinning or wandering brother or sister, which is our subject this morning, surely that's got to be the the ultimate work of a real and living faith, isn't it? He's calling them to wisdom, to applying the gospel to everyday life. How much more real can you get? How much more can you apply the gospel than by going after someone and trying to save them and bring them back, which is what God's done for us? Surely it's because covering over the sins of a fellow believer, the language James uses here, is the ultimate act of wisdom if wisdom is applying the gospel to everyday life. You can't get much more gospel-centered, can you, than being involved in the forgiveness of another person and in their salvation. Look at verse 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. He's talking there about prayer in the context of confessing your sins to one another, in the context of forgiveness. And in verse 20, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. You can't get any more practical than that, can you, in terms of applying the gospel, being involved in the forgiveness of another person and being involved in them being saved from their sins. Do you think that language seems a bit strong? Well, I'm deliberately stating that way, that way up front. I think what James is saying to us this morning is that we as Christians are involved, can be involved in an important sense in saving our brothers and sisters from their sins. In rescuing them. We can be involved in the forgiveness of other Christians. Now I've I've said that now. I've got to justify it as I go through. There are going to be two heads under which we'll do that. Firstly we're going to look at. Looking back at the passage from last week. How we can be involved in the forgiveness of other sins. By hearing their confessions. That sounds a little bit sacramental to some people. Again I'll try and justify that. But we can be involved in that way. That's the first thing we'll look at. And then secondly we'll see how we can be involved in saving the sinner by going after the wanderer. But firstly then, this issue of forgiveness in verse 16, hearing our brother's confession. This is one of the ways we're involved in living out the gospel by confessing our sins to each other. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The Roman Catholic Church has turned this verse in effect into the sacrament of penance and reconciliation or what's more commonly known as confession. 
And as far as the Roman Catholic Church is concerned, it is necessary for us to be forgiven in God's sight that uh, we as believers in Jesus go and confess to a particular person. That person has to be an ordained priest in the Catholic Church. And that is part of what it means for us to be forgiven. That's what the Roman Catholic Church has done with this verse. It's necessary for us to confess to others to be forgiven in God's sight. But that's actually a distortion of what James teaches here. Because the New Testament is very clear that we need no earthly priest to absolve us of sin. We don't need any earthly priest. When we come to Jesus Christ, I I find myself saying this a lot lately, but I won't apologize for again and again going back to the old, old story. When we come to Christ, we are justified, we are forgiven once and for all based on Jesus' once and for all work on the cross and in his resurrection. It's done, we're forgiven. And once we are justified, we cannot be unjustified. But what we do need, and we know this in our experience, is we live out the Christian life because we still fail and because we still sin and because that affects our relationship with others and it affects our ongoing relationship with the Lord. What we do need is this regular, if I can put it this way, relational repentance where we come back to God and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I've done that. Father, please will you forgive me? When I say that, am I asking, Lord, will you justify me again? You know, I've fallen back under condemnation. I need to be uncondemned and justified. No, I've been justified through faith in Christ. But when I come to him and say, sorry, I'm being forgiven in that relational sense. John speaks of this uh, in his first epistle, doesn't he? In uh, 1 John uh, 1, verse 9, we read these words. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. But if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. So we don't need any earthly priest. We don't have to come to a particular person to confess our sins to be forgiven. What we need is to come to God through Jesus Christ and we are forgiven. But uh, we good Protestant evangelicals, as we often do, I think, we read a verse like that. We see maybe what others have done with it. For example, maybe the Roman Catholic Church. And we react too far the other way. Because the fact is, James does say, confess your sins to each other. So what's that all about? I think it's about this, that confession to another person is not necessary for me to be forgiven. It's not necessary for me to be justified, certainly. And it's not necessary for me to be forgiven in that relational sense in my ongoing walk with God. It's not necessary, but it is helpful. It is good in certain circumstances. So what James is talking about here is sharing sins in some way with other believers, sins that I'm struggling with, sins that I'm falling into, and praying with them about those sins and those temptations in my life. Not so that I can be justified in God's sight, but to focus my mind on the act of repentance, to help me repent, so that the relational effects of my sins can be dealt with. Just to break this down a bit more to make sure it's making sense, I think this applies to my relationship with you, my brothers and sisters, this confession of sin, and it does also apply to my relations, my ongoing relations with God. There's a horizontal and a vertical aspect to this. So the horizontal one, um, my relations with my brother and sister, I think this is what Jesus speaks of uh, in Matthew. Um, we read this firstly in uh, Matthew 5. These are well-known verses. Matthew 5, 23 to 24. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, in other words, you've done something to them, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. That must be one of the circumstances that James is envisaging when he's talking about confessing your sins to one another. You realize, it might be in Sunday worship, it might be another time, but you realize you've wronged your brother or sister. What do you do about that? You go and confess your sin. You don't have to tell the whole church about it, but you go and say to your brother, your sister, they're aware that you've sinned against them. You say, you know, I realize I have done that against you and I'm so sorry. You confess your sins to another brother or sister. And Jesus also then in Matthew 18, again, these are very well-known verses. Matthew 18 verse 15 says this. If your brother or sister 
sins, this is against you now, go and point out their faults just between the two of you. Man, I wish we would listen to that and apply that better in the church. Just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. If they will not listen, take two or, uh, one or two others along so that every matter may be established about the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's where Jesus is speaking about how you deal with it when a brother or sister has sinned against you. If you can't just let it go, if it needs to be dealt with, you approach them and you speak to them one to one and you say to them, brother, sister, I, I feel you've wronged me. I feel you've sinned against me here. And the hope is that as a result, they will then say, I have. And they confess their sins to you as a brother or sister. Do you think that's right? I think it is that those are two circumstances in which this, this verse from James applies. That we can be involved in the forgiveness of a brother or sister. In our own forgiveness by the Lord. By confessing our sins to one another. How many tragic trajectories, tragic orbits away from the truth. Away from the Lord. Away from the church might have been prevented if we obeyed these verses better and tried to apply them in church. Because so many people who were in the church and have wandered off, planted away, have done so because they've been hurt, because someone sinned against them and never confessed it. This verse applies to my relations with my brother and my sister in the church. But also, it does apply to my relations with God. For example, in the context of healing we saw last week. James said, if any of you is sick, call on the elders. They can anoint you with oil and pray. And if you have sinned, you'll be forgiven. And the prayer of faith, in response to the prayer of faith, that person will be healed. This uh, confession of sin applies in this context too, doesn't it? So the idea here is in James that as the elders or before the elders are praying for me for my illness... I confess that particular sin to the elders, not that I've sinned against them necessarily, but I'm aware there's this particular sin in my life that needs to be dealt with. I confess it to my brothers and sisters who in that circumstance happen to be elders and they pray with me and they pray for me and I can be confident that when I pray with them and I mean it, they're helping me to come to the throne of grace and ask for fresh forgiveness and I, in accordance with God's promise in 1 John 1, I will be forgiven. Now, it's, it's my repentance and God's forgiveness that's important here. I cannot justify another person in God's sight. Only God can do that. But in this ongoing relational sense of forgiveness, I can be involved. I can pray with you. You can pray with me. We can confess my sin together before the Lord and know that there can be forgiveness. And that can bring great assurance and great peace. We can be involved in the forgiveness of one another. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a powerful application of the gospel? Only God can forgive your sins, as in wash them away and wipe them away. Only God can do that. We can't forgive sins in that sense. But we can forgive one another for the wrongs against each other as an application of the gospel. And we can come alongside one another when sin has been confessed to pray with one another and to seek forgiveness together. Isn't that wonderful? How practically do I go about this? What's this going to look like? I think it's important to say a few things about that before moving on to the second point. Wesley and the Methodists of his day used to apply this verse to their society meetings where they would meet to worship and pray, but they would also confess sin to one another. They had a detailed list of questions. We might call them accountability meetings today where you went through and said, have you struggled with this? Have you fallen in that way? And you would confess it before the brothers and sisters. Can I just say I am not suggesting that? That has been a blessing for, for some. Um, but I am not standing here at the front and saying that's what you need to do. I think we need to use real wisdom in how we confess our sins to one another. I'm certainly not suggesting that next rooted group, whenever that might be now, next rooted group, the things you've been struggling with and the sins you've fallen into and those secret sins that, you've, that have caused you pain, that you share them all with the whole rooted group. I'm not saying that. We've got to be wise about how we do this. Accountability can be a good thing, but we've got to be careful A, that we don't react against these verses and ignore them. And B, that we don't stretch them to breaking point and make them cover an unwise confession of sin to everybody. Wisdom is needed. How does this apply then? What does it look like in practice? Well, 
as a general rule, if it's a private sin, me against my brother, I need to confess it to him. If it's a public sin, then I should confess that publicly. If I wrong you as a whole church, I think it's quite appropriate for me to say in front of the whole church, I'm sorry. But it's when it comes to secret sins, it's a bit more difficult, isn't it? Is it really going to help if you go to another Christian and say, I've been so angry against you for months. I want you to forgive me. You need to use real wisdom there, don't you? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's wise just to not tell them. Is it wise for you to go to another Christian and say, I've been lusting after you for months? I don't think so. You, you see, we've got to use real wisdom in who we confess to and how. But I think this probably does apply to the situation where when you're really struggling, maybe with a secret sin that nobody else knows about, and you are confessing and you are telling the Lord you're sorry, but you continue to struggle and you continue to feel the pain of it. Sometimes that can be the place to find a Christian pastor, elder, a Christian friend, and one you trust and speak to them about it and ask them to pray with you about it. And you're confessing your sin to that friend then, that brother or sister, so they can pray with you. Not, to, not so they can give you absolution, they can't. But so they can put their arm around you and say, I'm going to pray with you about that, brother, sister. And so that they can say to you, and by the way, God's promise is this, when you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Please use wisdom in doing that. You don't have to do it for every secret sin. You certainly don't have to do it with the whole church. You don't have to do it at all. But what James is saying is this confession of sin to one another can be a powerful thing in the hands of the Lord where one believer feels supported in their confession to God and is assured of forgiveness of sins. Isn't this one way in which I can help to be involved in the forgiveness of another Christian? Isn't this one way in which I can be helped in saving Another person from sin. I can't save him from sin as God can, but I can be involved in the process. And James tells me to be. So that, that's the first way in which, looking back at the passage last week, we can be involved in the forgiveness and, in one sense, the saving of a brother or sister when they're struggling with sin or have fallen into sin. I feel I should add a PS that I probably should have mentioned five minutes ago, by the way. Sorry, before I move on to the second point, this is important. talking about the elders praying for someone that they might be healed and about confessing their sin. We, I did touch on this last week, but it bears repeating again. There is not a necessary connection between sin and sickness. The New Testament does not say that if someone is sick, if a Christian is sick, it is because they have sinned in a particular way. Uh, it occasionally appears to be the case that sin and sickness can be related, which is why James says what he does. Which is why Jesus said to the, the man who was paralyzed, who he healed, go away and sin no more so that nothing worse happens to you. There can be a, a link between sickness and sin, but that is not normally the case. Like we said last week, ask the Apostle Paul as he wrestled with his thorn in the flesh. Ask Job, who did not suffer and was not sick because of his sin. Ask the disciples after Jesus had healed the, the blind man. Do you remember what they said to him? Who, who sinned, Lord, him or his parents? And Jesus said, I paraphrase heavily, neither you idiots. It was it's because we live in a fallen world. There is not a necessary link between sickness and sin, and it's really important to say that. Sometimes there might be, but more often than not, there isn't. And I wanted to say that before I went any further, but praise God we can be involved in the healing of a, of a brother or sister, and if there happens to be sin connected with that sickness, we can be involved in their forgiveness too. As we come alongside them, Hear their confession and pray for them. That's the first way in which we can be involved in forgiveness and in the saving of another person. The second way is this. Verses 19 to 20, James says, go after the wanderer. Go after the wanderer. I think the, uh, the verses are worth reading again. Our text this morning. If one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. You know, we know it, most of us in this room. The sad reality is this, that people who profess to follow Jesus, who say they follow him and they love him, do wander away. Now, what we could do at this point is get into a debate about whether those persons who wander away were true Christians, 
who have lost their salvation. I don't think that's the case, by the way. I'll just say that, and you can tackle me over coffee if you want to. But we could get into this whole debate. Were they Christians or not? We could wonder whether they are true believers who have wandered away but will return. The, the, the jargon we usually apply to that in the church is they're backsliders. They've backslidden. Um, but the implication usually when we say that is they've backslidden, but they're going to come back. I know they're going to come back because they really are a believer. Or is this talking, is James talking about people who appeared to truly be believers but weren't ever really believers? It looked like they were. They said the right stuff. They did the right stuff. But then they wandered away and maybe they're not believers. Well, I think your theology on those things is important, but in terms of how we understand this passage, in one sense, it's not important at all. What category do you think these people fall into? I think the point is that we should all respond in the same way, whatever our theology. If someone has professed to follow Jesus, and now they wander off, they plan it away, what do we do? James tells us what to do. He doesn't say get into a debate about whether they were saved or not in the first place. Bring that person back. That's what James says they need to do. And especially in these very mobile, very consumerist online days where it's so easy for people to wander away and not even feel like they're wandering away really. Where it's very easy for people to fall through the gaps, to get forgotten. And dare we say it, sometimes easy for some people to wander off and we're actually happy to see them go. In days like these, we need to hear what James' response is, what the the response he urges us to, and he says about those people, bring that person back. Whether you think they were really saved or not, whether you do believe a Christian can lose their salvation or not, if they appeared to follow Jesus and they were around us and they wandered off, go and get them back. I really think, don't you, that this is a teaching that the 21st century church has neglected by and large? Our default position is, when someone wanders away, bring that person back. There may be exceptions, temporarily, if if church discipline demands it. In certain circumstances, if there's been um, behavior of a certain sort that has to be dealt with by the church, and that person momentarily goes away, or in certain circumstances, um, you might need to let that happen temporarily. If it appears that someone is a wolf, they're a false teacher, they've come in to stir up the flock and to separate the flock and to destroy the flock, then you, then you, you throw them out and good riddance. And they don't come back until they repent. But those are exceptions that prove the rule. And the rule is that a default position is when someone wanders away, do whatever you can to bring that person back. Our gospel-centeredness, our belief in the gospel, and application of it to our lives, our wisdom, if it means anything, means that it should make us into people who go after wandering sinners to save them from their sins. It's strong language, isn't it? To save them from their sins and to cover over their sins. What does that mean? Well, surely what James means is that by going after them, we're helping to bring them back to a place of repentance and restoration where they know their sins have been dealt with. I mean, the language that James uses here surely indicates, doesn't it, that the position, again, whatever your theology is about whether Christians can lose their salvation or not, the position that person is in spiritually is a perilous position. Whoever turns a sinner back from the error of their way will save them from death. And he's talking surely there about spiritual death. Will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. I think this is what Jude talks about when he says in verse 23 of Jude. I'll start verse 22. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. See, Jude uses that language too. He's saying to Christians, save that person. We say in response, oh yeah, only God can save. Well, yes, only God can save. He has to do the work in the heart. He is the one, the only one who can forgive and wipe away their sins. Only God can save. But there is a sense in which God says to us through Jude and through James, you save them. Go after them. If they've wandered away, go and get them back. We have a part to play in going after the wanderer, in being instrumental in God's hands, in bringing them back to the truth, back to the church. And it's so important. They're in a spiritually perilous position. We can't know for sure where they stand before the Lord. 
What we can know is that to wander away from the church and wander away from the truth, the truth of scripture and the truth of the gospel, is a spiritually deadly thing to do. Because if that person dies, having apparently rejected the truth and wandered from God, we have no good reason for hoping that they're with the Lord. They may be in his mercy because only God knows. Only God knows whether someone is saved. But we've got no good reason for saying yeah, that person is safe in God's hands if they've wandered away from the truth and never come back. James says, save them, go after them. Do whatever you can. James calls the community to action in dealing with sin. Do you see that's the big picture here in this, this passage of James? God, through James, calls the community of your church to acting against sin, to dealing with sin. Because wandering away from the truth and from the church is sin. The community of the church is involved. We are not called to sit in our pews or our comfy seats and say, well, well if, if they're saved or not, it's in God's hands. God is sovereign. We'll pray for them. No, we're called to more than that. We're called to do what we can to confess our sins to one another, pray with one another. And if that person who's struggling has got to the point they've actually wandered away, that we go after them. Courage is needed in that. And compassion is needed in that. But we are to go after them. This is the ultimate act of a wise and living faith. That one day you will get to glory and you may see people there in glory who will be giving glory to God and saying, thank you, Lord, that you saved me. And thank you that one of the things you did to keep me in the faith and to bring me back was you sent that person after me to save me. Do you remember we looked at the story of David and Jonathan weeks and weeks back now? We saw how we can be a means of grace in each other's lives. That God uses us in each other's lives to keep us strong in the faith. Isn't this one of the ways that happens when someone who's wandered is gone after, is chased after by another believer, but we don't do it enough to we? Shame on us for letting the wanderers plan it away. That is not the heart of Jesus. We let them go and we don't make a phone call. We don't text them. We don't try and catch up with them for a coffee. Or we do. Once. And they're not particularly receptive. And we say, there you go. Did my bit. Did my best. James says, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Don't you want to be involved in that? I do. There's probably people coming into our minds now. And what we're thinking is, oh, it's too long. You know, last time they were here, it was months ago, years ago been too long, it's too late. No, it's not. It's never too late. What about that person who hasn't been to Rooted Group, for example, for weeks or for months or to church for years? And they've wandered away. Well, they shouldn't have wandered away. No, it, it's sinful, yes. But what are you going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Yes, wisdom is needed. Yes, compassion is needed as well as courage. We can't physically grab them and drag them back into church. We can't be harassing them on a daily basis. Wisdom is needed. But do you see what James is calling us to? Where those people whose faces and names have popped into your mind as we're saying this, ask yourself the question, can I gently and wisely go after them and do what I can to try and bring them back? The joy of doing that, and of seeing someone come back to the truth, back into the fold, back into the flock, and knowing that God's used you and you've been part of that, isn't that a wonderful thing? And the elders and pastors in the church cannot do this for everyone. He doesn't say, verse 19, James doesn't say, um, if anyone has wandered from the church, call the elders of the church, and the elders will go after them. Doesn't, does he? He says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back. This is the corporate responsibility of the church. The elders certainly should be doing this, but they can't do it for everyone. You may be the link. You may be the rescue. You may be the means of grace that God uses to bring that wanderer back. And they may say when they come back, do you know what? Thank you so much for doing that. Actually, as I look back, I was never actually a believer. I hadn't truly trusted Jesus. They may say that. They may say, yes, I, I really did believe, but I just backslid and I wandered away. And thank you so much for doing that. It doesn't matter what they say. The point is we've gone after them and we get them back. We have a role in the church 
in, in, in this limited sense, the sense I'm talking about this morning, we have a role in saving other people from sin. And we have a role in seeing people in the church forgiven. Not that ultimately we save them or that we wipe away their sins because we cannot do that, but God involves us in the salvation of people from sin and in the restoration of the wanderer. That's living out the gospel. That's real faith. That's why James ends with this. And that's why James, as a loving pastor, says to us in his own inimitable style, wise up. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for, for the depths of Scripture. There's so much here that um, we can talk about and lovingly debate with one another, and we thank you that we can do that in the church. But we thank you also that some of the most important things for us are very clear and very simple. And one of those truths is that when a, when a sinner, either for the first time or in returning to you, comes and repents and asks for forgiveness, you promise you will forgive. And the other thing that is clear to us this morning, Lord, is that you're saying to us that as you work in people's lives, you want to use us to do these things. You want to use us in our, the lives of our brothers and sisters as they seek forgiveness and as they seek assurance of forgiveness of sins, you want to use us. And Lord, your heart goes out to those who have been here and have wandered away. Maybe weeks ago, maybe years ago, maybe decades ago, your heart is for them. Give us the same heart, Lord, and make us into people who go after the wanderer. May we listen, Lord, as James says to us, bring that person back. Give us the grace and the wisdom to do just that in the way that is right, to go and to bring that person back. We thank you, Lord, you went after us. That when we were prodigals, you came after us. You welcomed us with open arms when we came back to you. Thank you, Lord, that is your heart for us. Give us the same heart for others, we pray. May we not judge others who have wandered away, who may have faced terrible hardship that has led them to do that, but may we pray for them and also seek ways to lovingly go after them. Help us to be wise people, Lord, who live out the glorious gospel and show it in the way we live our lives. Help us to be people, Lord, who show that we understand what grace is and that we show grace to others. That we don't go after people and help them and come alongside them because they particularly deserve it, we come alongside them and go after them and help them because we love them, because you love them, and because you first loved us. Lord, as we reflect back on this, this epistle of James that has at times hit us very hard and challenged us and made us uncomfortable, thank you that you've done it because you love us and because you're a wise shepherd and friend. Help us to apply these truths to our lives and to live out the gospel and to wise up. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray.